I remember meeting Tom and Cherie, gosh, a couple of years ago now, and um, thinking, what a, what a wild and ambitious and maybe even insane dream that they and others had. And it, it, it just blows my mind to be here um, for these days and to meet people who are actually opening schools to train, enrolling in schools soon to be uh, trained, to be facilitators, opening businesses, opening um, production businesses, uh, being hired by the government to regulate it. Like, it's all happening. It's gone from just this kind of fantasy world to a reality. Um, I, I think I was saying to Tom, it's almost, he sometimes talked about how Measure 109 was a, a baby that, um, that he and Cherie gave birth to. And I feel like we're at like, I don't know, kindergarten graduation right now, about to enter first grade. Um, and it's really growing up. This child is growing up. So as people make their way in, I want to invite the folks who are already in the hall to just like settle in for a minute. And um, I'm going to be talking about the, na the, the larger national picture, but I, I just want to invite you to settle in for a second and think about how personal this is for all of us. Like who here has either struggled with or had a dear loved one struggle with really debilitating depression or PTSD? Like who here has sat with the loss of a loved one as they approach death and you just see how like the systems that we have now, some of it's working well with hospice and so forth, but how much better it could be. Um, who here has a veteran that's a member of their family, right? It's all of us. Like we are all directly affected by the mental health crisis that we're in. Mental health crisis doesn't even begin to describe what I'm talking about, like the heartbreak, the things that aren't working in our society around mental health. And so what we're doing here is creating a new system of mass mental health. And it's just breathtaking to me. It's one of, I, I mean, to me, I feel beyond lucky, beyond privileged to be able to be a part of, of ushering in what I think is really going to be one of the most important developments of, of these five, 10 years to come. So it's amazing. Thank every single one of you for being part of that because it takes all of us to make it happen. So I'm gonna talk about, as I said, the national picture a little bit. And I want to start with just a little bit of a, I don't know, civics lesson, if you will, about how these different laws work. One of the ways of getting access to therapeutic use of psychedelics is if the FDA, a federal governmental body, approves it to be prescribed by doctors, right? We all know this, so I'm going to move quickly through it, but doctors can prescribe it. And that's tremendously hopeful that MAPS, USONA, a number of entities are moving steadily through that process. And I will say, not that long ago, I thought that that was where all the focus should be. But what I've come to realize, what I think all of you know very well, is that's also not quite enough. We also want to have access for broader ways of healing and in modalities that aren't strictly medical. And so that's where this amazing Oregon law comes along. How did it come into existence? Well, again, you all know it was through a ballot initiative. And that means that 50% of the voters who turned out on election day in November 2020 needed to vote yes. If it had been 49.9% of voters who voted yes, none of us would be here today. None of this would be happening. And so in acting laws through the ballot initiative process um, is a you either win or you lose process, right? There's not a middle ground. And so I'm gonna be talking a little bit about that process. The other way that these laws can come into existence at a state level is if the legislature enacts it. And if you've been following what happened in California, Texas, Missouri, Maryland, all around the country, there have been efforts to move forward on psychedelic policy. The ones that have been successful so far, so I'll say briefly about Texas, it was bipartisan, it was led by conservatives. It sort of has to navigate through all the, the you know, complications of the legislative process of committee chair people who maybe don't want it, like it's, it's tricky. 
But at the end of the day, and usually there's compromise, at the end of the day, Texas passed a law that authorizes and funds research with psilocybin in Texas universities. So that's huge. I mean, politically, that's huge. And yet, like, think about what that is compared to what the Oregon psilocybin model is, right? It's much, much more narrow. So I think in the near term, most of the legislative process at the state level is going to be incremental. And in many cases, it will take two or three or four times to actually kind of get it done. So that brings me back to ballot initiatives. I've been involved in a lot of ballot initiatives over the years, and I played a role in making sure that the Oregon ballot initiative ended up getting the 56% it got, not the 44% that it might have gotten if there hadn't been a campaign. And we're doing the same thing in Colorado right now. So I'm really excited about that. If you check your calendar and do the math, and I did earlier today, it's exactly 50 days until the voters in Colorado will either say yes or no to a ballot initiative that will both follow in the footsteps of Oregon and that it will create a route for therapeutic access under state law to psilocybin, but it even more broadly lays out a pathway for all of the major plant medicines. And so under the Colorado law, within one year, it can be faster in Colorado, it was two years here because we had to figure a lot of stuff out. In Colorado, within one year, there will be access to, to therapeutic use of psilocybin. And soon after that, through a process that will have to involve stakeholders in discussion, there will be access to the other major plant medicines. I, I think this is huge. This is an amazing thing. Yeah, let's, we can have a round of applause for that. So. Will we actually be able to make this change in Colorado and then in other states? I think the answer is yes. Based on the polling, based on the interest from all of the different advocates, I think the answer is yes. But let me share with you what my biggest worry is. It's actually what happens here in Oregon. Because in Oregon, we need to get it right. Right, in Oregon, if we are able to follow the kind of intention uh, that all of the speakers have been laying out so far of building out a delivery of care system that is safe, that is effective, that is equitable, if we can do that, that is uh, crucial to people enacting these laws in other places. So again, let me go back to what I said a few minutes ago. To pass a ballot initiative, you need 50% on election day. So that means it, it's not enough that the people who are really tuned in and paying attention to psychedelic policy are supportive. It's not nearly enough because there are not enough of us out there. You need to really be able to reach mainstream, middle of the road, younger and older, conservative and progressive, urban and rural, we need to reach people across all the demographics and actually be able to tell the story that this is something that they want. So again, it kind of comes back to Oregon and what we do here. But let me tell a little bit of like how that opinion formation gets done. So to do these campaigns that we've been doing over the years, including the one in Oregon, we start by doing a lot of polling, talking to ordinary voters, not the and, and, and see, this is tricky because everyone that I actually know and talk to regularly thinks about the world kind of like I do. And so if I only talk to them, I'm like, wow, we, we, this is easy. Everybody supports psychedelic reform. This should be totally easy. But doing focus groups, and we've done them in like Pittsburgh and Tucson and Atlanta, um, across lots of different demographics, you hear something very different. People aren't just like gung-ho for psychedelics. But the reason I'm hopeful is because it's a kind of blank canvas. It's a kind of blank canvas. But what people share in common is that we have a mental health crisis, that the depression, where I started, what we all know, the depression, the addiction, the PTSD, the difficulty around dying. Like these are things that every single American that I've encountered in doing research says what we're doing right now is not nearly good enough. And the solutions that we have and the solutions that we're even considering, not nearly good enough. The pharmaceutical solutions that have been offered, not nearly good enough. 
And so everybody's on common ground. And think about the America we live in right now. How many things do we have common ground on? It's like almost nothing, right? We're becoming divided and polarized in so many ways. But this is something people unite on. Next, you tell people there's some research out there that suggests there are some hopeful new approaches. We're not using the word psychedelic yet. Hopeful new approaches for these conditions that are so difficult. And again, common ground. Everybody's like, great, tell me more. I'm very interested in that. And then presenting there's credible research from universities and I'm great, you know, some of the really great researchers are here. I saw Steve Ross in the hallway and Robin was here yesterday. There's research going on that shows promise and everybody's still on board with that. And then the last piece is, okay, we've got a proposal for a law that's going to create access to these promising new modalities and there are guardrails around it so that it'll be safe, so that, so that it'll be, you know, comfortable for everybody who's voting on it. You add all that together and you have a majority support just about anywhere. So there's this pathway towards victory that we can do in Colorado, that we did do in Oregon, that we can do in many other places. But let me bring it back to Oregon. If what people hear is, boy, what they're doing in Oregon is messed up. There's this story that I heard about the person who had this really bad outcome or you know, some bad thing happened and that's the one fact that voter knows. Then they go from yes to no. And the trick here is, some of those bad things will happen in Oregon. With any new innovative modality, there are going to be some things that don't go perfectly. And even with a tried and true medical or health innovation, there are some things that don't go exactly right. So there has to be context. So, so here's, here's really the point that, you know, I think whenever I do a public talk, I want there to be a call to action. So my call to action for you all, you who are going to be operating service centers, training centers, who are going to be facilitators, who are going to be involved in this system, is to remember it's important that we get this right, that we're paying attention to safety, to effectiveness, to equity. It's important that we get it right. But there's a second thing too, which is it's important that we be perceived as getting it right, right? Right? We can do everything really, really, really well, but if the voter in Colorado or California or New Jersey or wherever it is, the only thing that they know is the one bad story, then it doesn't really matter that we got it right to that voter. So my call to action for you is a couple of things. Number one, when something is going well, go out of your way to make sure that story gets told. Right? And we don't naturally do that. If we're doing really well, we just keep going on doing what we're doing. But it's really important that in the work that you're doing, make sure that story gets told. And so the corollary to that is please participate in outcome measurements. Like I've just gone off the rail into kind of the nerdy, but it's super important. There will be efforts, I don't yet know what they are, but there are going to be efforts that are going to call on you to spend your time and energy of, to fill out surveys, to, to collect data, whatever it is. And it matters so much. Because if there's one thing, if there's one story of a bad outcome, but we can document that there are a thousand stories of a good outcome, well, then that's a very different context than the only thing we know is there's a bad outcome and we have a vague sense that some good stuff was happening. So let's all participate in trying to create a system that's safe, a system that's effective and equitable, but let's also really participate in telling the stories of success and gathering the data to document the whole thing. So I'm very hopeful. I'm very hopeful about the future that's here to come, that state by state, we are going to actually be spreading and expanding on this Oregon psilocybin therapy model. And since we're first here, let's do our best to do it really well. So thank you all for everything you're doing. Look forward to talking some more. Thank you, Graham. Our next speaker is Ismail Ali, he, him, or they, them pronouns, who has been personalized, personally utilizing psychedelics and other substances in celebratory and spiritual contexts for over 15 years and has been actively participating in the drug policy 
uh, reform movement since 2013. Ismail is Director of Policy and Advocacy at the Multi Multidisciplinary Association of Psychedelic Studies, MAPS, and serves on the Board of Directors for SAGE Institute in the California Bay Area. Ismail advises, whoop, page turn, is formally affiliated with or has served in leadership roles for numerous organizations in the drug policy reform ecosystem, including Students for Sensible Drug Policy, Shakuna Institute, and the Ayahuasca Defense Fund. In addition, Ismail is a co-founder and founding board member of the Psychedelic Bar Association. Welcome, Izzy. Wow, 14 minutes and 10 seconds, huh? Okay. <laughs> thank you, Graham. Um, thank you, Horizons, for the invitation. Thank you for the um, opening. Um, I was really excited because I was at Horizons New York in uh, December of last year, and I remember after a few years off, I was like, what's well, going to be like? The field has changed a lot. Um, but I counted an equal number of people with hula hoops and people with suits, and we've got the vibe going here. So I really appreciate Horizons' ability to hold on to the culture while also expanding into what's happening. I want to appreciate Graham and the ACLU project that he founded because it was where I got my career start before I started with MAPS seven years ago um, in the San Francisco office. So I really appreciate this arc and the way that this is all moving. And I also want to give a shout out to the speakers. Um, I'm honestly obsessed with the lineup today, not just because I'm on it, but today I really appreciated hearing Blue Valentine, Barb Hansen, Claudia Cuentas, Pilar Hernandez Wolf, Angie Carter, and so many others over the course of the weekend. Uh, there's so much to say, I don't have that much time. After the Boston Trauma Conference, which was earlier this year, someone gave me the very loving feedback that I should have fewer points to be clear on instead of trying to cover everything. I'm not listening to that feedback today, so I'm gonna spend <laughs> the next 13 minutes um, trying to be really succinct by riffing a little bit off of what Graham just shared, um, sharing a bit of context for the psychedelic policy ecosystem at the national level and zooming way out and offering some perspective from my perspective on the whole project that we're in the midst of. So let's get to it. How does the Oregon model fit into the national drug policy discourse? I won't belabor the point because you've heard a lot of context over the last few days, but Oregon, as you have heard, being the first to create a regulated adult use system means that it is at the front of the pack, and that is inspiring. Credit to Alice, Sam, and so many others for painting the picture of that possibility over the course of the last few days. It's really, really amazing. It also means that a lot of mistakes will be made and lessons will be learned. Transparently, I've been both supportive of and critical of Measure 109 since 2019, and I celebrate the critics, many of whom are here in this room. I can critique a policy up and down the block. It's my job. I'm a little bit allergic to people calling uh, psilocybin services psilocybin therapy. Sorry, friends. Um, <laughs> that is and could be con confusing for consumers. And I was skeptical when decriminalization was taken out of the draft that was eventually put in front of voters. But I was gratified. When both Measure 109 and 110 passed, grateful for the conversation we had about it today, I'm grateful that it was platformed each bill in their own lanes with their own narratives. Bravo. That synchronicity may or may not be able to be replicated in other places, and I'm curious about how we iterate on broader drug policy reform as we move forward with psychedelic policy. And I also accept the invitation from Dr. Rachel Knox to be on the Social Equity Subcommittee, joining Angie Carter, Pilar, Claudia, Rebecca, Ilan, Amber Center, and so many others, because I believe that this, even with my critiques, is worth putting energy and love into in alignment with the enthusiasm that a lot of us are feeling today. So jumping off of what Graham was saying and looking at the state landscape as a whole, my suggestion to the out-of-state policy advocates here in the audience, let's take advantage of the system that we have to utilize states as labs to pressure test new policy. That's what's happening here. In the last few, in the last few days, you've heard from entrepreneurs, economists, drafters, funders, and guess what? None of them know exactly what's going on either. Have you noticed that theme? This isn't mean, meant to be disparaging. To the contrary, it's meant to show that despite our different positionalities, we're also all in this together. And nothing flattens the playing field like the great mystery, but I'll talk more about that later. So I'm skeptical of the cookie cutter, let's draft, let's draft something and assume it can be replicated everywhere approach. I don't think it's mindful of the differences in political and cultural climates, which is why I appreciate that what you're doing involves iterating as you go. It also guarantees that a committed stakeholder process has not gone through, and I'm seeing how large, well-capitalized policy interests as well as the grassroots are learning how to kind of titrate and navigate with each other as we move into this space. And given our collective sheer knowledge, or lacks thereof, about what an ideal policy environment might look like, it's a bit of a symptom of our hubris to think that we know what exactly this needs to look like. 
So I appreciate the willingness from all of the people who are participating in this program, both to create something new and also to iterate on it piece by piece with the space to make mistakes, with the space to do something that has very, very, very high stakes for so many of us. So I love that we're here to humbly try and try again, not unlike what Brian Anderson was saying earlier regarding our emergency plan. Your emergency plan as a provider in some ways, we're trying to create an emergency plan for a really big emergency that we're all feeling. In one sentence, you mentioned Graham SB 519 in California. I just wanted to note that we did try and went for decrim only. In one sentence, we almost got the personal use of six different psychedelics through the legislature, successfully through three committees of the Senate and the Senate floor, and two committees of the Assembly before the decrim provisions, provisions themselves were pulled out in the last committee of the Assembly before a floor vote. A longer story that can be shared here, but between Texas and California and Oregon and everything in between, what we're seeing is a pretty diverse policy landscape that I think we want to be engaging with on those terms for the sake of understanding where are the points of failure, where are the points of success, and how do we iterate together. So there's a certain balance of community, policy, and politics that together make a sustained social progress possible. It might be more of an art than a science, but to Graham's point, polls definitely help. So in short, let's experiment, critique when helpful, and be pragmatic when we participate. Otherwise, you're just on the sidelines when there's a lot to be done, and we're all stepping into the shadows to bring direction back into the light. So I'll move on to, from that soapbox to a different one, talk a little bit about what else is going on in the field. Um, it's really good to know about decriminalization as a, as a concept. It's, there's not enough time to drop into it here, but decriminalization, really deprioritization of enforcement at the municipal level continues, San Francisco being the most recent jurisdiction to pass that. And if you're really interested, I gave a talk at Horizons in 2019 in New York that really spends like 40 minutes plus like an eight minute meditation on uh, decriminalization and like how to really understand that concept as it fits into this larger, larger ecosystem. I wanna to touch on the topic of religious and spiritual use because that's happening a lot. It's both a national conversation, something that's happening at the state level or increasingly so. As someone who spent a lot of my own time in my own process in the realm of ceremonial and spiritual use and practice with entheogens, and as an attorney who works with churches seeking to protect their spiritual practices, I am beyond sympathetic to this approach. It is the original way, and it is the way that I believe many of us hope to return to, even if we don't always know it. In some ways, I see the medical and therapeutic frameworks as our attempts to recreate that within the Western and materialist cultural context. And regulation is our attempt to create guardrails that fit the mystical experience, again, as Brian mentioned earlier, within a system that makes sense to the rest of us. And I really respect that attempt for people who are within our cultural context. And I'm concerned and I would caution against trying to fit uh, spiritual practice into the same box as regulated adult use or medical use. They're similar but not the same and hamstringing spiritual practice that is more than just about healing. As Pilar said earlier, it's also cultural and political and community. It's much more than just healing. Trying to put that in a system that has the intention of healing, of healthcare, of treating mental health disparities is a trap. So make sure that we give the room for the paradigms to have the space that they need to be what they want to be. And I think while it's important that we're seeing psychedelics through a medical paradigm because of that value, that is not the whole picture. It never was and it will not be in the future. I wanna to touch on this concept of safe harbor um, that Dave and Casey mentioned on Thursday. People have talked about a coal memo or these different approaches. Um, I just wanted to note that one of the benefits of a system like Measure 109 is that it creates to some a reasonable regulated system that may not actually re require external intervention. It looks like something that could work and that the state could regulate itself. The many complexities not notwithstanding, and we all see it, we're all at least trying to hold something under control. We're all part of this pro process to see how do, we, how do we do it. And I think that eyes wide open approach is really admirable and really important. And I think that actually bears well also for the state kind of experimentation and whether or not the federal government actually interacts. This morning, Barb Hansen spoke briefly about Right to Try, which is moving forward on two fronts. One, for those that are that kind of nerdy into it, the Right to Try litigation is back in federal court, this time with final agency action. For those DEA nerds, final agency action with the DEA is a pretty freaking sweet. It's a big deal because it doesn't usually happen. Um, and if you're interested in participating in that, find Catherine Tucker and me later to, be part to participate in that process. The second prong is the bicameral and bipartisan Right to Try Clarification Act, which just makes sure that the Right to Try law applies to Schedule One drugs. And that's really the thing that's kind of crunchy in this conversation. Again, a much larger conversation, but I'll just touch on that for now. For many years and still, the Holy Grail has been and was federal funding for research. You can see the case, right? Promising research, difficult to treat challenges, 
should be Shuin, right? Right, NIH, right, Naida? Yeah, that tap has started to trickle through in the very recent past with Ben Kilmendi and Matt Johnson, but whether or not the rest of the other dedicated researchers out there will be showered in bounty for their patients does remain to be seen. And I want to close this phase of conversation of federal policy by naming that just a couple days ago, Politico read an article named uh, The Mellow Biden's Not Harshing, which describes the administration's relatively favorable or at least open-minded approach towards psychedelic policy reform, including toward the funding or research question, and I find that very promising. Y'all with me? I've been talking really fast. <laughs> it's the end of the day. It's the end of Saturday. Okay, all right. I see your eyes on me. We're good. Um, so. I want to zoom out a bit and um, close with some observations um, that are related, I think, to what's happening in Oregon and also may have rever reverberations excuse me, beyond that point. Um, on Thursday, Tyler Norris told the story of his sister in Central Oregon who benefited from psilocybin and said, my sister doesn't need an industry. She needs community and she needs other kind of support. That really impacted me, not because I have my own skepticism of business and of corporations and of all the things that a lot of that has been brought up here, but because it's true. A lot of the people that I've seen benefit from or engage with these topics, with these substances, what they needed was not a product. It was a, it was, it was, a, it was, it was maybe this medicine or this substance in the context of both their own cosmology as well as their own network and connection. And I'm really, really grateful for the way that so many people in this room over the course of this weekend have been talking about the rest of the ecosystem. I think it might have been Tom or some other people who were saying, yeah, there's a certain amount that 109 can do and there's a lot that it doesn't touch that has to be filled by the community. And I love, love that so many people are are, are participating in that, and even with the like, what the heck is going on this, and we're gonna try something new, the commitment to do it, because that is actually how we solve problems that we've never seen before together. So I love that. Today, Claudia Cuenta said something that I've been thinking for the last two years and has been ringing in my, in my head a lot this weekend. Urgency is a trap. Did you guys see that? It was on the screen, big letters. Urgency is a trap. And for a long time, I've been talking about this tension between um, the urgency of need and quality of care. This like, how do you balance these things? It's really challenging. But more and more I do see how urgency kind of informs, and especially when it comes to the political process, the economic process, how entrepreneurs work, how businesses work, it's really easy to see how the urgency that we use as a lever to get something done is part of the trap that's actually keeping us all stuck in this thing that we're actually trying to break out of and maybe underlying a lot of the mental health challenges that we're trying to treat. So when we're reviewing policy, when we're meticulously combing, th combing through the rules, which I finally did this week after um, you know, being in here, beware not to lose perspective. A lot of these regulations, in my opinion, these paradigms that regulate use only exist, and perhaps today they need to exist, I don't know, reactively, because we're dealing in the wrecked wake of a world socially and culturally charred by prohibition and colonization. Whole healed societies do not need to coerce these boundaries and behavior because we know when we tap in, we feel it, we know. Many of you have felt it. We're doing this, we're creating these systems because we don't trust each other and there's good reason not to. We've hurt each other a lot. One of the most beautiful things psychedelics offer, at least to me, is the remembering of what we've lost through conditioning and coercion. But we also know, and this is part of the kind of reining in of the ego of the Messiah complex that we see, our own knowing is actually not enough. I love that Brian said earlier, like, trust in the process of peer review. And I was like, yeah, like, let's do all of this together. <laughs> so our own knowing is not enough. When knowing is witnessed and woven into community becomes knowledge. And when that knowledge with time and generations of pressure testing becomes wisdom, that wisdom is something that this regulation is trying to emulate but may never replace. So don't lose touch of the wisdom as we engage with these policies that are important to understand on a technical level and also hold these other levels of, of truth. And my prayer right now is that we, may we remember a way out of the maze of regulation and restriction, not just in the law, not just with 109, not just with psychedelics and drug policy, but with this world that we're trying to create together. So my last comment, I'll say, just to zoom out, because I was reading the rules and I was like kind of laughing and I was thinking, you know, no rules can contain the fungi. Um, it's really cute that we're trying. Um, as I said before, as a policy advocate and analyst, as an attorney, as a participant in the field, I'm trying to, like this isn't disparaging. I'm saying I'm part of this process of us trying to figure out how to con contain or control or hold or at least channel what's going on here. But it's a starting point, I say that, to kind of cut through the, the delusion of control of an agency that we've like kind of latched onto in America and society. 
because um, it's all a bit silly, our, our laws, our regulations, trying to find the words is always a noble endeavor. But the great mystery is bigger than all of this, and it's the real reason we're all here, whether we know it or not. So blessings to you for trying, and blessings to all of us for being here. Thank you for your time. Thanks. Thank you so much, Izzy. Uh, so reminder to the audience, if you'd like to submit questions for Graham or Izzy, use the QR code on the back of your badge. I'll kick us off with a question on, you know, we've been talking a lot about what's already been done in Oregon and looking ahead a little bit to Colorado, but can the two of you paint us a picture from your perspective of what you think this landscape in terms of legalization will look like 10 years from now? Maybe give us a range. Well, you know, one reference point is what was the timeline for cannabis reform? And so, you know, that's been state by state and, and I think has moved more slowly, honestly, than, than psychedelics will. So um, I'm more optimistic than that timeline. So I guess what I would say is within five years, half of the U.S. population will have access to a state-regulated model um, that will have some resemblances to what we build in Oregon, but we'll build on it more and more. And I think in a five-year time frame, uh, MDMA very likely, psilocybin hopefully, will also be approved by the FDA, so there'll be this parallel path of access. And I think 10 years from now, there'll be a whole new system of mental health care. I think that's really the time frame in which um, there won't be a question of legality, illegality, you know, 280E taxes, like any of this um, stuff. There will be a whole new paradigm of how we do mental health, wellness and mental health care. And um, yeah, that's about the time frame I'm thinking. Dan, could you imagine having to deal with like 280 and banking stuff 10 years out? <laughs> that's a that, that's a world I'm not trying to. That's a picture I'm not trying to paint. Um, I, I agree with a lot of that. And one thing that just comes up in in this conversation is both the similarity and also this interesting theme. I don't want to jinx it, but that psychedelics seem to have, in some ways, less political baggage than cannabis does. The cannabis fight, because it kind of like built so long before it was like really a political force in so many ways, um, in parts because of the work in Oregon um, and so on over over many years. Um, it, I feel like the conversation about cannabis by the time it really hit the national stage was already very charged. And even though it's incredibly um, bipartisan among the populace of the United States, it's, it clearly has not laid out that way among um, the representatives. So I think that because of what you were saying earlier in your talk, Graham, like that so people might have heard of magic mushrooms, but until a couple of years ago, not that many people knew what psilocybin was. So the it's fact that you had more of a <laughs> blank slate means that some things could move faster. Um, and one big question I have related to the landscape in 10 years is um, the question that a lot of people here are asking, which is what the interaction will be between the federal medicalized system through FDA, the kind of treatment networks in that sense, and then the state level regulated systems and how those things will interact. And my biggest question is like, what's the threshold? Who gets to decide, uh, do you qualify for this type, of this type of framework or that type of framework? And um, hopefully in 10 years, we have at least 10 different kind of iterations and mm -hmm. Hopefully at least like, you know, nine and a half years of good data that we could be using for, for whatever comes next. Yeah. I'll just add one thing too, which is I think I think that the decriminalization process, or I like your phrasing better, the deprioritizing mm -hmm. of arrest process is also going to accelerate. I mm -hmm. think that the fear of arrest for people in their individual individual or even group use of psychedelics um, will recede quickly and, and that's accelerating. So I'm, I'm not sure what the time frame for that is, but I think that's a positive trend that will accelerate. God, I hope that in 10 years we have, that the personal use of, that what you put in your body isn't criminalized. Like that would be really nice. <laughs> 10 years is a long time, but. Question for you, Izzy. How can we avoid the categorization of psychedelics as medical? Seems like that's how the general public will accept it. Yeah, I mean, it's, and that's a good point. And that's like, uh, that's the point, which is that like, if you're actually trying to campaign or like bring it to the general public, it absolutely is true that it's more evocative and many times more effective to talk about it from like the benefits framework. Um, how to avoid it? I might frame the question a little bit differently, but what I'll say is, 
even if you're looking, I mean, LSD is an interesting example, NMDMA is an interesting example because they're newer in the synthetic, um, or at least their final form is synthetic. And, and I, I bring those up because even those substances were never only used as treatment. And it, even though there is the beginning of the story of MDMA and it's starting as a, as a treatment in its early days, um, I think that the existence of these other frames of use, and especially when you look at what does healing, let's say, like there's the medical, which is like to me kind of a term that refers to a particular regulated system, and then there's healing, which includes that potentially, but also looks like the celebration, the communities, other things that aren't as captured by like a healthcare system, or at least historically haven't been. So I think one way is to just look historically at like the, vari the variations of use. Like if you look at substances like ayahuasca and other plant medicines, they're used for um, cultural cohesion, they're used for political decision making, they're used for family system development. They're, there's so many things, like I said, Pilar said it earlier really beautifully, that there's a lot of things that are beyond just that particular paradigm. But I see that's effect that the effectiveness of that like in the political conversation. So. I would differentiate, should we talk about it as a treatment or medical care in general, which I would say no, I think it's bigger than that. But then there's a different question when it comes to engaging politically in, on a campaign framework. Um, yeah, and I think there's a certain pragmatism that needs to be brought when you're having conversations about what is it that the people want to hear or are ready to hear. I think my concern there is I do worry that it's a trap that if we say, oh, this substance should be legalized or decriminalized because it's good for us, First off, the good for us has a bunch of asterisks. It's complicated there. And I think the concern I have is like, what happens when we try to have the conversation that's more about our rights, what we put in our bodies? Like, do we have to prove that everything is good for us to prove that we should have the right to not be criminalized, or to, that, to prove that we shouldn't be criminalized to use it? And that, that's the dichotomy that I'm a little bit afraid of. But people have short attention spans, so maybe I shouldn't be so worried about it. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Next question, what differentiates the path of legalizing psilocybin from the legalization of cannabis? And also, will broad legalization eventually be the goal? Well, I think the biggest difference is, I mean, cannabis certainly has medical uses and the political strategy, if you will, I think, you know, sort of started there, but Cannabis is in the phase right now of basically being a consumer product um, that has a huge you know, economic force behind it and the potential of a whole lot of profits, and I think that's warped how implementation mm -hmm. has gone in, in, in many places. And at least as I look at what's likely to happen in Oregon under Measure 109, it's not that. It's not, it's not a consumer product. There aren't going to be dispensaries. There's, I mean, honestly, there's not, a, I don't think, any huge amount of money to be made. And so it doesn't sort of attract monopolistic um, impulses in the same way. Um, I think most of the economic activity is going to be between facilitators and clients who are paying for the time that is incredibly valuable. And that's, that's also, I mean, you don't really hear about like big psychology, right? <laughs> you hear about big pharma, but you don't hear about big therapy exactly. Um, <laughs> And I'm happy about that. And so, <laughs> so, I mean, there are a lot of differences, but I think at least in this moment, that's the biggest one. I think it gives us a lot more breathing room in Oregon to create a, um, a system in which the economics don't really warp the outcomes in the same way. Just to add it quickly onto that, one thing that I hear a lot, and I imagine you've also heard, is people saying, all right, we just need to, we can't, we gotta, gotta, do, gotta do it differently than cannabis. And I started asking, there was a conversation earlier, someone was saying, they're like, so what about cannabis do we need to do differently? Because I hear that a lot, the line, we gotta do it differently than cannabis. And I'm like, okay, can we, can we get a little more granular? Because like, what is it? Because there were things that went wrong or things that went right, and of course, that's, that's another example of something that was iterated on that we're still trying, that we're still kind of sorting out. Um, but it's made me wonder, like, what exactly like, is it that we want to identify that went right and wrong? And I think the point that you just made was super important, that the cost, most of the, the, the cost of care, frankly, and the cost of the services is gonna be, it's the time spent as a facilitation, right. which is very, very, very different, where like, whether or not mushrooms can be grown at home in the future, which they should be able to be, by the way, but whether or not that's the case, like the cost of the substance is not really where the large volume of, of um, kind of financial benefit or economic movement is. It's in the services, auxiliary stuff, yeah. 
And, and I'll add one more thing too, which is that I think a lot, especially the, the initial impetus for the cannabis reform movement was about ending mass incarceration. Just the, the tremendous the number of people and the racial disparities in, in marijuana law enforcement um, is uh, unacceptable and I think is really was the starting point for driving a lot of cannabis reform. And um, with psychedelics, it's not about mass incarceration in the sense of everyone's being put in prison for long amounts mm -hmm. of time for psychedelics. Although interestingly, I think through good mental health and trauma processing and all of that that psychedelics can contribute to, it's almost like getting that mass incarceration at the very beginning, right? If, if you can process trauma more, there's going to be less of, I don't know, the system, anyway, long, longer conversation than we can do in four minutes. But I think that's the other distinction. I, I've heard this described by some people as, um, I don't know if this is a crude way to put it, but that a lot of the issues around mental health and uh, quality of life and so on are upstream from mass incarceration in the right. sense that they are like in many ways the causal factors of some of the things that lead to that. Of course, also poverty and other things, but I just wanted to say that I think that people are starting to build the relationship between mental health, the kind of social determinants of health, and then like outcomes like incarceration. And that's why I think this, this it gets to that conversation, but through kind of a different approach than getting volumes of people out of jail. You yeah, say. that's a great way to put it, Izzy. Yeah. Thank you. Next question. Will Measure 109 become irrelevant in a future where we have a federally approved medical model and decriminalization and First Amendment protected right to access? I don't think so. I really don't. I, I actually, like, one thing that I've been really riffing on the last, like, couple months, and I think I really want to be focusing on the near future, is this idea that multiple policy approaches can be harmonized. And I, I can see why someone might see, if you look at the four, let's say, four circles in a Venn diagram, you've got religious and spiritual use that looks like something, you've got decriminalized use, which allows a certain amount of like economic and interpersonal activity up to a certain threshold, you've got the FDA-approved kind of medical system. I do personally feel like that there is a place for regulated adult use outside of all of those. Um, because each of them has their own limitations and benefits, and I would like to see an environment where all of those actually are possible. And my big question is, what is the interaction between the systems, which is something I think we're going to be figuring out together, but that would be my answer. I think that they can all coexist and should. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I would go a step further and say they not only can they coexist, I mean, yeah. the, the, the Measure 109 approach is really the one that is most boldly claiming a mm -hmm. different form of mental health care and mental wellness. Mm -hmm. Um, the, the prescription drug approach is super important, especially for people who have more significant diagnoses and probably for some of them will fit better into a traditional medical model. Mm -hmm. But the sort of, I don't know, if you will, wellness model that Oregon is inviting, I, I don't, you know, maybe it could find its place in a medical system, but I don't know, who here would defend our current medical system as like the perfect way to deliver mental health care or mental wellness, right? I don't think it is. And so this is, a, this is, a, this is an, a, an attempt at something very, very different. And even though we don't know exactly what the answers are, it is a field that's opening up that creates incredible possibility. So I'm super excited about mm -hmm. this. Beautiful, thank you. And if folks here in the audience want to get involved in policy reform in some way and they aren't already, what would be your advice to them? I guess it depends on which policy. Um, mm -hmm. You know, like I, I think if you're here in Oregon, and I know many of you are visiting from elsewhere and are part of the national movement, but if you're here in Oregon, you know, I think the, the, the work that um, Alice and Sam are doing with Healing Advocacy Fund, I have, you know, probably more visibility on that than other things, mm -hmm. but I certainly recommend working with, with them and, and that organization. Um, but it, it depends on which policy. Like, if you're mm -hmm. interested in decrim, there's all kinds of great stuff going on. If you're really interested in the medical model, that's also a good thing. So, like, you know, w work with MAPS in the, and, 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 you know, MDMA approval and that sort of thing. So, I don't, I don't know. I don't have a great answer for this, Izzy. Do you, what's the one place everybody should go to? Well, well, the thing I've been thinking about a lot lately is that different um, state environments, different policy environments have different educational needs. And I think that a lot of the kind of uh, more like hammer a nail approach has been like, well, we're going to teach them what we think that they need to know. And what I've started to learn is it's actually really good to do the inquiry into what your local or state or federal regulators actually like are seeking, what kind of information they need. 
um, because people are coming from a lot of different paradigms. Sometimes you need someone to hear it from the medical paradigm. Some people need to hear like this is ancestral use and it's a right, rights-based thing. So I tend to say like look into what it is that the people who are in power relative to you know, whatever it is, of religious use or medical use, who are the people who are in that decision-making frame and what is the kind of information that they need within their paradigm? So my answer is education, but my answer is kind of always education, so I'm not sure if that helps. <laughs> right. Okay, thank you both. Thank you, Alice. <laughs>